Here we go. Hello, hello, everybody. We're just letting everyone in here. Get started in a couple of minutes. Feel free to turn your cameras on, say hello. Heck yeah. Oh, a couple more people. Let me get them in here. Yeah, 29 now. 30, 40. Hi. People are coming up. Ray, I see your, your shin. Once yeah, people drop the rain, we'll get started. <laughs> there you go. All right, Can who else we got? Us? Thanks, everybody, for joining us for a safety day edition of Live Ask a Rigger. We're going to let a few more folks join the call. Let me just admit. For those of you who don't already know Shauna, I'll tell you just a little bit about her. Um, she has over 2,000 skydives. She holds multiple ratings, including AFF, coach, tandem, and pro. She's also a coach examiner, AFF evaluator, and as you all know, she's pretty boots on the ground in helping to educate our new instructors. She's also a videographer, private pilot, and she serves the Eastern Region on the USPA Board of Directors. Um, as most of you know, she's a master rigger, and she really takes pride and passion in teaching others. So I know she's super excited for this Ask a Rigger today. Uh, she's going to share a short PowerPoint presentation. I'll be running that in the background and feel free to put your questions in the comments along the way. So without further ado, I'll let Shauna take it from here. All right, hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming in tonight. I know we're all gearing up, getting ready for safety day this weekend. So uh, USPA has asked if I, did a, if I could do a quick pre-safety day uh, chat real quick. So when you guys get to your safety days this weekend, um, hopefully everyone's taking the advantage of signing up for one uh, March 12th, Saturday, and uh, this is going to bring up some good questions for you so you can ask whoever you happen to be uh, getting presented to. Hi, I see you waving <laughs> um, at your safety day. So without further ado, and uh, I hope everyone can see this clearly. All right, so we're going to go for the first slide here. There we go. You can keep going through. All right, good. So some of the things, if you guys are at a regional drop zone or a seasonal drop zone and you don't do a lot of jumping over the winter, just a couple of things that you want to start looking for on your gear. If you're planning on jumping at safety day, I know our drop zones, we don't jump on that day. It's strictly and solely focused on safety, gear, canopy piloting and uh, collision avoidance, as well as plane safety. And we also talk about the uh, fatality report from 2021. So, um, and I see some of you guys have your gear ready to go. Phenomenal, Tomar, awesome. All right, so we're looking here, we're looking at your three rings and your RSL. Obviously, this is a specific manufacturer. I believe this is Mirage. And there are other manufacturers that have their RSLs and their RSL clips, uh, there are cell shackle um, clips on different sides. So let's get familiar with where your RSL is. Is it on your inside right, inside left, outside right, outside left? Do you actually have a have a RSL? I've had kids come in um, with gear that they've bought on their own over the off season. Brandy new A licensed jumpers. They found a great closet queen from someone somewhere that was willing to sell them something. And unfortunately, it doesn't have an RSL. It's not AED ready. It has adjustable main lift webs that don't have, um, that have like ridiculous signs of wear. So we're gonna be looking at these main things and where do our RSL and, uh, and the three rings fall in? Well, our gear check, our check of threes, right? So when we're students, we are learning our check of threes. So the three rings, all right? The three attachment points, your chest, strap and your two leg straps, as well as your three handles in the order that you use them. So your main pilot chute, your cutaway handle and your reserve handle. So I, I can't see my notes on this, but Shannon, if you wanna to go to the next slide, there are a million and a half ways that us as humans, specifically skydivers can figure out how to misrig something, right? And I'm sure you all can agree with me on that, all right? so. When we're taught to do our 
gear checks. All right? Even when we're looking at our gear, when we get them back from our riggers, from our repacks, um, what are we looking for? We're not looking for what can go wrong or what it's, what's wrong because there's about a million ways that it can be put together wrong. We're looking for what's right. All right, so if you look at these two different pictures, is it readily uh, visible to you guys what's wrong in these two pictures? All right, if it's not, let's look a little bit closer because on first inspection on this left picture of the three rings, uh, the jumper didn't realize what was wrong here. All right, so let's click on, uh, there should be a transition there. If you wanna, I think if you got a, there you go. Check that out. So the type 2A loop that secure is supposed to be only through the little ring is actually through the middle ring. All right, so on quick inspection, if you're not paying attention to this, you could miss this and you could jump it like that, which would it work? Mm, I don't wanna chance that. That's a lot of extra load on that little type 2A uh, housing right there, that 2, 2A loop, as opposed to evenly distributing the load through all three rings, all right? Now, what about on that right-hand picture? Can we all see what was wrong with it? This was actually jumped a number of times like this, okay? And this was because um, the owner of the rig, and I've spoken to him and I've gotten his permission to use this, the owner of this rig switched canopies several times over the jumping weekend, all right? Um, Experienced jumper. He had his, uh, I think he had his D license at the time and was very, he knew what he was doing. All right. So this was the last step. Unfortunately, uh, if we look at it, if Shannon, if you go ahead and, and click next, another red circle come up, check out where that RSL lanyard is coming through. Oh, sorry, I got to go back. Where that RSL lanyard is coming through, it's coming through the bottom ring. And then it's connecting to the actual RSL uh, guide loop right there. All right. No bueno, that, that's no good for all you guys. So this is what we're looking for in gear checks. So when we're looking at our fellow jumpers and we're giving them a gear check, we're again, looking for what's right. And I found this when he dropped it off to me for a repack and I called him up and said, hey bro, uh, we might wanna talk about this. And I sent him a picture and he's like, how did that happen? I'm like, I have no idea. I, I didn't hook it up like that. He goes, oh, I changed canopies a couple of times last weekend while I was jumping. I'm like, you jumped it like that? He goes, I did. I said, okay, well, knowing's half the battle. All right. So, um, you know, us riggers, we're humans. We can make mistakes too. That might've been a very easy one that could have been missed. Um, so we need to make sure that we're paying attention to the details. All right. All right, let's go to the next one. And this is the correct way it should be done. All right, on the left, the big ring obviously is hardwired into the harness. Then we have the middle ring and then the baby ring with the type 2A loop going through only the little ring and then through the grommet on the riser. All right. And then on the right hand side, we're seeing the correct routing of that red RSL on the inside of the, the three ring system and connected only to that little RSL guide ring. All right. When you disconnect your RSL, and this is something that I tell my fun jumpers and stuff, if you disconnect that, whether you're going to use it or not, whether you're doing a repack or not, the only place that that should be hooked up to is that hard housing. All right. I'm not a fan of it getting connected anywhere else. Even if you take your main off completely and someone wants to hook that onto that large ring on the bottom, it's a horrible habit to get into. All right. It should only be going ahead and being put onto that hard housing. All right. Okay. Any questions so far? I can't see our chat group. Let me bring that up. Okay, I see it here. Nothing in the chat so far, but also feel free if you guys can raise your hands and um, yeah, don't totally. be afraid to come off mute if we call on you. So did we all do our Ask a Rigger Safety Day Edition poll questions? Because I know well, we have here. Let me run the poll really quick. <laughs> yeah, let's run the poll real quick because I want to see who we have out there. All right, it's been launched. There we go. Let's I'll see. leave this up for the remaining of the call. Perfect. We should all, or you should at least be able to see the results. Show now. All right. Feel free and jump on that poll there. Six questions, super quick. All right. Awesome, guys. And if you want, throw in the chat what state or country you guys are tuning in from. Because I would love to see the reach that we're getting. Because we're always looking at making these zooms better, more um, interesting, and reaching a broader, broader audience. All right. So let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, 
All right, so our VOC are the bottom of the container. So before I was jumping, and I know there's probably a couple of you on here that were jumping way before I had gotten into the sport that we had leg throwouts, which was awesome. And then they transitioned to the BOCs. So this specifically is a throwout system. Um, some of you might have a pullout system where the closing pin is directly connected to the, the putt or your hand, uh, your hand handle, and you pull it directly out. This is a throwout system with the pilot shoot Oh, North Carolina, nice. So we're looking at after a long season of jumping, chances are your BOC because it's just spandex. That's all it is. And a lot of times that you're pulling on it to open it, to push your pilot shoot back down, it's going to get warm. All right. So we want to make sure that our BOCs are in good, safe, safe working order. And I'm pretty sure the very next slide might be the, the safe and unsafe version of that. All right. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> So on the right hand side there where it says unsafe, this was actively being jumped. <laughs> One of our jumpers brought it and said, hey, can you throw a couple extra stitches up there in the, uh, the little 11 o'clock position <laughs> in the left hand corner and said, hey, can we just tack that close? Because my pilot shoot seems to be uh, shifting around a little bit. I'm like, eh, how about we just replace it? So yeah, it takes a little bit of work. That happened to be an old wings container. Uh, so it was a little bit of work, but way safer. We don't want a premature deployment if, say, we're sit flying or if we're really doing anything in free fall. We'd rather know when our main parachute is coming out and not get surprised by that. All right, so that's huge. And over on the left-hand side, that is a safe, almost brand new bottom of the container pouch. All right, and they're not super hard to put in. You know, it'll definitely take your rigor a little bit, maybe an afternoon or whatnot, um, depending on what container it is. But that is a that is a safe, free fly friendly BOC pouch right there. All right. All right, let's go. Oh, we got the chats. All right, I'm gonna look real quick in the chat where everyone's coming from. Awesome. Sterling, Virginia. Very cool. New Jersey, Ontario. Awesome, Jennifer. Thank you. Morad, thank you for joining us. And we got West Coasters. That's very cool. Each town. I don't know where that is. A non-jumper. We love to have you anyway, doesn't make a difference. <laughs> Connecticut, People's Republic of Brooklyn, that's awesome. <laughs> Southern Indiana, Ireland, heck yeah, we're across the pond, that's great. <laughs> okay, Utah, DC, Costa Rica, Greece, that's wonderful. Well, I'm so happy to see what a great uh, reach we're having here, that's really awesome. And let's see what the polls look like. Very cool. All right. So we definitely have some students out there, but 11% of you guys, which is great. The bulk look like or C&D licenses. That's awesome. So you guys have been around for safety days, which is really cool. But I know that we have some C licensers out there and some new coaches and whatnot who have actually never been to a safety day. It's just kind of been in between seasons. So for all of you who are very fortunate for jumping at drop zones year round, awesome. I love it. But for us out in the Northeast, where it snows almost all winter, this is a chance for all of us to get back together to see everyone's happy faces and just kind of get back into the drop zone family aspect of it. All right, so what we got here? You, do you participate in safety day? Wow, 76% of people do, that's awesome. Well, it's not mandatory, it's always a great idea to get there because remember this too, if you are rating holders, all right, coaches, tandem instructors, AFFIs, uh, portions of your safety day also are in compliance with your standardization meetings that you have to have to renew your ratings. So I know at our drop zone, we're having specific meetings and specific Zooms for all of our rating holders. And they're gonna go up through everything from student handling to emergency procedures. Um, so we make sure that everyone's on the same page prior to the start of the season. All right. Man, everyone answered. Ah, uh, the majority of everyone answered. Majority. That FAA Reserve Repack. That's awesome. Okay, once a year. Okay, so <laughs> trick. That that one's the military. I have to say, so the military reserves do have that waiver where they are able to get repacked once a year. So that is true, and I bet that was my North Carolina military jumper, right? Um, every 60 days, it used to be 60 days, it used to be 30 days. I'm sure a couple of you out there remember, I see Peter, you're shaking your head. I know that you remember the natural fiber uh, rounds and whatnot that had to be packed every 30 days, right? 
So, all right, here you go. Oh, sorry, Jason, didn't mean to call you out. My bad. <laughs> all right. Uh, is your reserve repack in date? Wonderful. No, but I'll do it soon. It's so cute because I've got about six rigs sitting in my loft that got dropped off this week before safety day is on Saturday. Oh, okay. And I was like, yeah, after everyone all, all, all off season saying, hey, we'll get it there. We'll get it there. It's the last uh, last minute. Last six good. Uh, totally. So this is a bonus question we have here. Number five. Um, is your reserve older than you? And this is an interesting question. So nobody answered yes. <laughs> I don't know if you want to admit to it. We don't see your names. <laughs> but the four of you that answered, I'm not sure. This is actually a really interesting question because um, there are certain manufacturers that don't service reserves after 20 years or they require them to be re recertified. And if your rigger is telling you like a week before you want this repack done saying, hey, your reserve is too old, we have to send it back to the manufacturer. That might be something that you wanna know prior to dropping it off. All right, so I think that we all should be in the know of, um, of how old our reserve is and mainly what manufacturer it is. Okay, and I know I get from a lot of new jumpers, they say, oh, we have a, a PD reserve. Okay, is it a low bulk optimum? Is it a regular PDR? What is it? And they're like, it's a, it's a PD reserve. Okay, or it's an aerodyne reserve. Okay, awesome. We, need, we should really know what type of it is, what size it is, all right? And question number six, do we know what color our reserve is? All right, and the majority of people said yes, which is awesome. We can't unfortunately elaborate any more on the poll, but some of them said, no, well, how come you don't know what's, what color your reserve is? Is it because you've never seen it? You've never used it? Um, you may not be a jumper, so you don't know, but there are certain telltale colors that reserves come in. All right, we most popular one is orange. So bright safety orange. All right, we do have like a baby blue. All right, there is white. I do have one reserve in my, uh, in my jumper cache that is red. It's bright red, which is kind of awesome. It's an older Aerodyne reserve. Um, there are yellow ones out there. So it's kind of cool to know what it looks like before it's actually over your head and you need to rely on it, okay? And just a real quick side note, um, I was telling Shannon before we started, seeing your reserve and it, its components and knowing how they work is huge. I had a jumper that uh, came into the loft, bringing her stuff in uh, after a cutaway, extremely upset yelling at manifest, not happy that I must have damaged the slider on her reserve slider because there was a hole in it. And she was dead serious. And I said, well, I mean, how did you not know there was a hole in your reserve slider? She's like, well, you must have damaged it when you packed it. <laughs> I said, well, no, actually most manufacturers have a hole in it. So it comes down faster. So your reserve opens faster. And she didn't believe me. She decided to yell at manifest a little more. And we said, okay, fine, whatever. But as a rigger, I love having jumpers in the loft to watch their repacks. I want them to pull their handle in front of me. I wanna see that pilot shoot launch. I, I take a video of them doing it because a lot of them don't know how it actually comes off their backs. All right, so that's a big thing that you might wanna know if, if your reserve, if your uh, rigger is pretty cool like me, um, they'll have you in the loft and, uh, and you can watch their repack. All right, very cool. You got any questions at this time? Just to make sure. I answered no because uh, Lisa, no worries. I'm super happy that you're that you're well. You're jumping, and who cares if you're using student gear? That's awesome. A lot of our kids are using student gear too. Yep, David, do you remember pop? Do you recommend popping the reserve every time before handing it to a rigger for a repack? Honestly, I prefer that my jumpers do it in front of me, so I can see the pilot shoot come off their back. Because if it comes off in some wonky direction, that needs to be addressed with the previous rigger. And then I have to look at the, I look at the gear just a little bit differently. And I want them to be able to transport it safely. If they have this pilot chute hanging out everywhere and they throw it in their car and then bring it to me, chances are they're probably gonna snag it on something. So I prefer they do it with me in the loft. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, what other questions have we got here? I have a question to Lisa's point, is there? Yeah. Is the information and the color of the reserve repack on the repack card when they pull that out of the student it's gear? It's not, but it's very telltale if it's you see the manufacturer in the model. So okay. 
just thrown out there for performance designs. All right, so PD, they have two different types of reserves. So they have an optimum, which is orange. It's a low bulk reserve and all optimums are orange and they have a PDR. So a regular, um, uh, regular ZP canopy, a regular full bulk canopy. They can be, older ones can be yellow. They can be baby blue. I've seen older ones that are white. So those are primarily the three, um, the three colors that they have. Um, with Aerodynes, uh, with their smart reserves, their low pack volume ones, they're generally white. I have seen that red one that we have at our drop zone, very well cared for. It's only about 12 years old or so. Um, I have seen a black one, which was just strange. I've never seen a black reserve before. Um, but a lot of times you can actually even take the serial number if you don't know, and you could just email them saying, hey, what color is this reserve, the manufacturer, and they'll tell you. Or you just ask the drop zone rigger that's doing the uh, that's doing the gear maintenance for you. That's a great yeah. question though. What are my thoughts on low pack volume reserves? Are they safe? Yes. Oh my goodness, I love you. I love that you asked that question, Jennifer. Um, in my opinion, when you have a container, I love to max out the size of the reserve. Yes, it might be harder for me to pack, especially when they have like a big main canopy, but I always think it's a good idea because a low pack volume reserve can, you can fit a bigger reserve into a smaller container. Okay, so if you take a standard size, like, I don't know, say a 143, all right, a standard size 143, you can probably fit a low pack volume 160, close to a 160 in that container. And the majority of the manufacturers now, what they have are comparison charts. So they'll have what a regular pack volume reserve can fit in the container, as well as the different options for a low pack volume um, reserve. I like them. Um, I've, I've flown them both and I find that they flare the same. Um, the low pack volumes to me as a rigger, they're easier to pack, obviously, because they're less bulky. The material is a little bit thinner and you can fold them a little bit easier and put them in the free bags a little easier. But yeah, I think they're totally safe. Um, and I prefer low pack volumes just because again, you can get a bigger size reserve into a smaller container. Okay, great question though. Awesome. Could you briefly explain um, how that slider could have had a hole in it through? Okay, so Matt, that's a really great question. The question was, could you, could I briefly describe on how the slider could have had a hole in it through activation deployment? Okay, great question. I wish I had a picture. So if you look at your slider, a normal main canopy slider, it's solid. There's no holes in it. A reserve slider, because nine times out of 10, it's going to be a um, subterminal opening. All right. You want that slider to come down quickly and open that canopy fast over your head, right? So the less fabric, the better. So in the center of that reserve slider, there's usually a square hole. And it's, it's a finished edge. It's almost like an open porthole right there. And it just comes down quicker. It still works the same way. It just allows the canopy to open faster for you, um, especially being subterminal. Does that answer your question? Hopefully it does. I can't see you, but... I think you're giving me a thumbs up, maybe. Um, awesome. Oh, oh, thank you, Matt. Okay, good. All right, let's go on to the next slide. We're making some good progress here. This is awesome. Uh, let's see if we have any questions here. Uh, all right. I mean, all right, rubber bands and brake lines. These are my pet peeves. All right. I cannot stand when I see like rubber bands like this on a D-bag. This is ridiculous. Number one, I, I used to do it when I was a younger jumper. I'm like, ah, I don't wanna get up for my pack job and, and replace a rubber band. And I'd go to crank on it and I'd punch myself in the mouth. So I learned really quickly, it's easier just to replace them and not punch yourself in the mouth, but it's safer. So I had a jumper with me in the loft today and um, she brought to my attention that she has gotten into the good habit of replacing, if she replaces one of the main locking stoves on the grommets, if she replaces one of the rubber bands, she makes a point of doing all of her rubber bands on the grommet stoves because she also knows that one crappy rubber band can let go faster than a brand new holding tight rubber band. All right. So we make sure that we replace them all at the same time. All right. Which is a really great habit of getting into. Uh, with rubber bands, you got to be careful. You want to make sure you don't mix and match. All right. I, I apologize for not having a picture here, but um, I'll throw, I threw it up on a couple of my Facebook posts and Instagram posts. 
we had a run where a manufacturer had sent several different size rubber bands in one order to area drop zones. And we were seeing very skinny little ones along with the big fat ones on main, main uh, deployment bags. Not okay. Let's make sure all of our rubber bands are uniform. And another pet peeve of mine is having so many extra rubber bands on your uh, little attachment points. So if you don't have a semi stoless bag and you're constantly doing the line stows on top of the bag, why do we have 10 extra rubber bands that are not being used? They're snag hazards. Cut those things off. The rubber bands, not the, not the, not the attachment points. All right, so cut off any rubber bands that aren't being used. It's just more of an opportunity for your lines to get snagged, excuse me, in the rubber band and you have some type of malfunction. Just take that out of the equation. And then our twisty, awesome lines here. Goodness, this, this drives me up a wall. Um, so what is better, just on the rubber bands, what is better, rubber bands or stoless? You know what? That's a very personal question. Um, for years, when I first got my first containers, I had fully stowed uh, bags. So I had all the rubber bands on them. And then I moved to semi-stoless. And then I moved to fully magnetic. And I loved them. And it's a very personal choice for each individual jumper, but you have to be informed on the pros and the cons of each type of bag. Right now, my personal gear that I use all the time, they're semi stoles So I'm good with that, but all of our student gear, they have all stowed bags. All right. Um, what are your thoughts on double single stows for locking stows? Our military guys, single stow, first transport rigs, but all right, cool. So there's actually a packing video from the main manufacturer from PD saying that you will double stow everything. The locking stows, I'll give you one example where I don't recommend it, but the locking stows, I will always, always, always recommend double stowing. All right. Now we may not double stow on tandem locking stows, all right, because the bulk of the lines is so much that it puts enough pressure on that stow that it's not going to come out faster or prematurely, all right? Or heavy Dacron lines. We do have a couple of student canopies that the Dacron lines are thick enough that there's enough tension and pressure closing that flap and keeping those uh, lines inside that rubber band that we don't need to double stow it, all right? And if you do double stow it, is it bad? No. Have I seen the interior lines being pulled out first? Yes, I have. So, um, I, I always recommend double stowing everything. And it drives me up a wall when I open a main rig and I see one's double stowed, one's single stowed, one's over here, one's over there. Please be consistent. So if you're gonna single stow, single stow everything. If you're gonna double stow, double stow everything. Make it consistent, okay? Do I recommend not using smaller bands? I personally only hate them because they're tiny and my fingers aren't tiny and it drives me up a wall, but there are plenty of jumpers that do prefer them because you don't double stow them. They're small enough where they fit the lines through them and there's enough tension that holds them closed like you double stow a larger band. Uh, I just particularly don't, I'm not a fan of them, but totally personal preference. Jason, awesome, double stowing, no issues so far. That's wonderful. All right, so this right-hand picture right here is uh, an awesome, brake line that was currently being jumped. And uh, looking at the free bag back there, it was probably a tandem line. I don't know, but uh, well, no, it's not. I don't know what that is, but this is um, a potential tension knot nightmare waiting to happen. All right, so remember when we were kids and we'd spin around on the swings and everything, or we'd, uh, we'd twist our shoelaces and then we'd get that little curly cue. This is what can happen with your lines, all right? One brake line is always gonna be more twisty than another brake line, all right? And why is that? Generally because if you're right-handed or left-handed, you're always gonna drop one toggle first, stow that other toggle, the other one's gonna spin a little bit, you're gonna stow that, and that's how we get twisty brake lines, all right? I recommend every 10 jumps or so that we untwist brake lines from the cascade all the way down to our toggle, all right? And that's, I mean, tension knots can hang a slider up. They can shorten a brake line just enough that it starts your canopy into a turn. If you have a high performance canopy, yeah, exactly, Peter. You can start turning from that. That's a malfunction as well. 
All right, so we wanna make sure, especially sub 100 canopies, those things are no joke. Those things can get spinning so fast. They'll throw a couple of Gs out there. You can go unconscious pretty quickly. So a little bit of prevention on the packing mat prior to a jump is worth its weight in gold. Okay, any questions on that? No, oh, awesome. Next slide, please. <laughs> The awesome main closing <laughs> loops. <laughs> so the main closing loops, these were all actively being used. That center white one, um, right dead center, that was a newer one. But what is, uh, what's the allowable amount of wear that we have on our main closing loops? Does anyone know? 10, I know, I know that. We're gonna go, does anyone throw it? Oh, look at this, 10%. Good job, guys, absolutely. So 10%, so what is 10%? I'm not an engineer, I'm not a mathematician, but I know a fuzzy main closing loop when I see one. So if there's a question about it, just change it, all right? I keep a hundred or so at our drop zone, ready to go. And I'm probably gonna forget to get the dollar from you that it costs to, that we sell them for. So just come grab a new main closing loop, put a new one in, all right? There's no reason for guesswork. And uh, has anyone here seen a grommet? We need to make sure. So if you look closely in the first picture, there's a little silver washer. You have to use a little silver washer, okay? Because the tension of you pulling that closing loop and closing that container, number one, you're probably gonna catch your fist in the chin because you're gonna pull that knot right through that grommet, all right? But it keeps the actual knot from getting pulled through the grommet after use, after use, after use, so you don't have a premature opening, which could actually end up resulting in a horseshoe malfunction, all right? So we need to make sure that the washer's there, that it's not, um, that it's not worn out like a couple of these on this pictures are. And well, let's, don't forget the washer. Yep, Ray, absolutely. Um, slinks as a closing loop. You know what? I, I haven't seen that yet, but I have seen, um, I have seen sewn closing loops as opposed to the type 2A uh, sheeting that we normally use. I've seen thousand pound spectra line. I've seen uh, tandem main closing loops shortened to make them a little bit more wear resistant and they're used. Um, I don't see why not you'd still have to make sure it was the appropriate size. And I'd still put that washer on there because metal on metal, I think is gonna be a little bit more uh, apt to not pull through that grommet as opposed to the fabric on a slink pulling through the grommet. All right, because not all grommets on that, on that uh, closing loop flap on your containers are the same size. Okay, remember that. Some of them can be a little bit smaller. Some of them are a little bit bigger. Um, you wanna make sure that it's not gonna pull through. So, I mean, I'd stay with the, the traditional type 2A uh, material if you're gonna do anything. And there's plenty of colors out there. I think we had a whole bunch of colors at our drop zone a couple of years ago. All right, so again, a dollar, make sure you change these things out every couple of jumps or so. Um, I would definitely keep a, keep a lookout for those. All right, next slide, please. All right, this is, how can I tell there's a lot of pressure on my, hang on, let me see what that question was. How can I tell there's a lot of pressure on my crazy pins? That's a great question. All right, so I was quite, I was messaged on the side. Um, how can you tell if there's a lot of pressure on your main closing pin, all right? And sometimes jumpers are gonna notice that there is more pressure on their closing pin depending on the humidity or where you're packing your, your canopy. That's a great, uh, that's a great um, observation. So if your main closing loop is too short, all right, you are probably going to struggle closing it, number one, but when you seat that main closing pin in there, if you can't easily slide it back and forth with a little bit of effort, it's probably too tight and it might result in a pilot chute and tow. All right, so if you deploy your pilot chute and it's too tight, it might not be, it might not have enough drag um, to actually extract it. All right, so if you can, if you cannot pull your main pin through your main closing loop with a little bit of effort, it's probably a little bit too tight, all right? And do I prefer packing um, canopies in the summer or the winter or like the cold? Um, 
in the cold, I feel like they're a little bit fluffier. Um, the humidity, I can actually get them down a little bit better and they pack up a little bit smaller and I can get them in the bag a little bit easier. But it also depends on how worn out or ragged out your canopy is too. A brandy, brandy new canopy will give you an issue regardless of the humidity. Um, but you can definitely tell the difference. Sometimes they close a little bit better, sometimes they don't. And I'm always extremely hesitant about changing the length of your closing loop, like mid jump day. It might just be a bulkier pack job that you're doing. Take it back out, do it again, take your time. Let's not rely on, oh, it must be the, the closing loop and readjust it. And then the next pack job is really, really good and it's too loose. Because a too loose pile or a too loose main closing loop can do what? It can also cause the potential for a horseshoe malfunction. All right. And that's that's one of the malfunctions that you guys definitely should be going over during your safety days. All right, no, we are. I hope that answered your question. If not, um, I'll throw my uh, I'll throw my email in here. Just email me and um, we can go over it a little bit more in depth. All right. So this is something that I thought was very interesting. We had a question from an individual um, through our email when we first put this event up saying, um, you know, how often should I change my risers? How often should I change my leg pads? So manufacturers along with PIA have something that we call limited life components. So what is a limited life component? A limited life component would be something like, okay, through the course of their manufacturing and their experience, they've noticed that between, say, this number of jumps and this number of jumps, these specific components tend to wear out a lot where they become unairworthy and they should be replaced. All right. Now, the FAA does not have a strict limit on limited life components. This is more of a manufacturer thing because they've seen over, I don't know, 25, 30 years what actually happens to these things. So, the question is, what is a limited life component? And the answer, if we can click the next one, there we go. Components of a harness container system that manufacturers have determined degrade after a certain number of jumps or a period of time. Wonderful. Let's get a couple of examples of those. Let's hit, hit the, uh, your BOC, specifically stated in most manufacturers' uh, manuals, your main deployment bag and rubber bands. All right. Your main pilot chute and bridle. All right. And the last one, just another example, are your main risers. All right. Let's go to the next slide. And here's some average jump numbers. All right. For the type 17 main risers, every 200 to 400 jumps. Now, again, remember that this is just a broad guideline. These are numbers that manufacturers across the board over the last however many years they've been doing this have seen that typically they either fail between those jump numbers or they show excess of enough wear that they do require to be replaced. All right, so type eight risers, the 300 to 500 jumps. Again, one of the critical components on those risers that we all have are that type 2A little white fabric loop that goes through that little ring and captures the Luan cables and cutaway cables behind it through the actual hard housing, all right? They can be replaced by your riggers. It's just an arduous task, so it's easier just to grab yourself a new set of risers. And you don't want any wear on those. If you're, and how's the way that we can get wear on your risers? Because we get lazy and drag our rigs to us packing, all right? That's a great way to go ahead and, uh, and accelerate the wear on your components, all right? Any webbing? that's frayed. Now, I know I had a couple of jumpers show me that uh, the stitching on the front of the risers or the bend of the risers where the actual um, rings are sewn in, it's overstitching. So it's not actual stitching coming out, it's overstitching. All right, so you can see that. Um, I kind of snipped that off a little bit. Um, but if there's any question, if the, if the actual webbing is fuzzy, Chances are you're going to have fabric breaking in there at some point, and you might, you might as well just go ahead and, and replace them. That's just me. But this is what the manufacturers, and this is, I, I checked a bunch of different manufacturers, and this is the general consensus on what we're showing. All right. Next slide, please. All right. Let me just make sure I'm not missing anything in the chat. All right, good. And here's a couple more limited life components. Your main pilot chute. So this is a trick that um, I learned, unfortunately, a little bit too late. Your main pilot chutes. Everyone loves to 
to kind of hang on them for as long as you possibly can. All right. So if you have a ZP or a zero porosity pilot chute, and you know for a fact that's what that is, and you put it up to your face like the ZP side, and you can breathe pretty easily through it, time to change it. it you shouldn't be able to breathe through it. All right. Just like a canopy. That's kind of like the breath test. But if you have an F-111 pilot chute and you put it up to your mouth, you're going to be able to breathe through it. All right. It's a it's a limited porosity. OK, so we want to make sure that there's no holes. Hold it up to the light. If you're getting, you know, pock marks in there, if you have scratches in there and stuff, you want to make sure you keep a keep a look on that fabric. And also that hacky. How many times does someone have like a dangly hacky? And I hate to put it like that, but you have that hacky or you have that pull or the putter or whatever on your pilot chute, and it's so far away from your actual pilot chute material, like that's not okay either. All right, that's dangerous. That's a snag hazard. Please just ask someone to tack it back in there or get a new one. All right, don't have dangly hackies. All right. Um, main deployment bag. If your grommets are supposed to be silver, and they have successfully tarnished to a green, uh, or if they are so pockmarked that um, they're just really rough, like someone took a hammer to them. All right, time to change. <laughs> Bro, you're, you're actually, I see people laughing because I'm sure we've all seen them. Um, you can replace the grommets. Is it worth it? Ugh, it's a task, but you can replace the grommets. And uh, do we know how those grommets get all banged up like that? Does anyone know? Throw it in the chat if you do before I give away. How do the grommets on your main deployment bag get all dinged up? Hmm. Washing machine damage? What's, what's that? Right. Somebody washes the V bag? I don't know. Good guess. It actually happens with um, the lines on it and the, uh, the excessive force over time with the rubber bands pulling the lines onto the grommets. Yeah, so it doesn't happen yeah. instantaneously, but it's overuse over and over and over again. And um, so you're saying yeah, we're I mean, not supposed to wash our V bags? I'm not saying that you can. I would actually throw it in a um, in a pillowcase before you put it in your washer and damage your washer. Um, okay. I would put it in a pillowcase, and it keeps your grommets from getting dinged up, and it it protects your washing machine too. Good idea. Yeah. Can we go back to that last slide, uh, Shannon? Prior to that, there we go. Leg straps, chest straps, this sort of thing. So on articulated harnesses, which means you have the hip rings and the chest rings that your straps are attached to, much easier for, um, for replacement if you need them. When we're looking at leg straps, this is huge. We had a jumper show up last year to bring, um, to bring their rig in for servicing and we pulled the leg pad back just to check the harness and to undo the leg straps and the webbing was so damaged it was actually cutting through the indicator thread and it cut into the leg strap webbing so when we're looking at our own if you're landing if you're sliding in your landings all right if you have uh two-part leg pads um if you slide anything in i would definitely suggest you looking under leg pads and the harnesses um where the where the junctions are on the hip junctions, just to make sure that we're not having excessive wear because things can hide, all right? And yes, it's up to your rigger to make sure your entire system, when they service it and do their repack is all airworthy as a whole, but it's also your responsibility as a jumper and the owner, all right? Spandex main pilot chute, we talked about that. Uh, main closing loops, we talked about that as well. And again, these are guidelines, all right? If you're unsure, ask a rigger or you can call the manufacturer send them pictures and they will definitely get back to you. They're usually very helpful, All right? And that is what um, limited life components are. And if you go to the last slide. And I think this is a, do we have any questions? So if we can go back to the gallery view so we can see everyone. Oh, yeah, there we go. I just slide it to the side. Oh, there we go, that's how that works. All right. For any so, late joiner, feel free to answer the poll. I'm just about to turn it off here. We have 64 people. This is awesome. I love it. All right. What kind of questions do we have here? Anyone want to go ahead and throw their hand up or throw something in a chat? No? Hmm. All right. 
Let me see. Oh, oh, that's my own hand going up. All right, let me think. Do, when it comes to our AADs, oh, hang on. Where would you attach a tracker to your main D-bag arisers? Great question, Jennifer. All right, so we've seen a lot of these new GPS trackers or Apple AirTags. Uh, I know I've put them on mostly all of our, our uh, canopies here. What I do is I put them in like a little, it's like a little ravioli square that I sew out of Cordura. And I attach it right to the main D-bag with a zigzag stitch all the way around so there's no little snag points. And we've had really good luck utilizing those to recover canopies in the event of a cutaway. So I prefer them being um, attached to the D-bag, away from where the lines are stowed, preferably on the bottom near the grommet where the, the, pilot, or the uh, bridle comes out of. Um, I've seen them put on the risers, definitely. And, I'm not opposed to it, it's just, it wasn't my personal preference, but I'm sure if you get one small enough and you're able to attach it to a riser, as long as it's not gonna snag anything and cause any type of hazard, I'd say I wouldn't see that would be a problem either. I prefer just the little Cordura ravioli stitched to the D-bag. And I'll throw some pictures up on, um, on my website as well as uh, I'll throw them in this PowerPoint presentation too. So if anyone uh, anyone wants to see them. But if I have a coach training, I do have some Oh, awesome. That's a great question. This is a, a rating question. All right. So for all you rating holders out there, uh, if you have a coach rating and you jump helping someone who is sit flying, does that count towards my coach um, recurrency or my coach uh, requirements? Yes, it does. You don't necessarily have to work as a paid coach at a drop zone to meet your requirements as a coach. If I go out and I happen to want to jump with, let's say, uh, Jeremy Taylor. So me and Jeremy Taylor, we want to go out and we want to do a jump, but I'm really good at belly, but he's really good at sit flying, but wants to get better at belly. I'm like, well, let's go do a two-way. And I coach him how to do that. Just because it's not necessarily a paid coach jump, it still counts because I'm coaching him how to do something. All right. So hopefully that answers your question. I think that's awesome. And it's always easier to make sure, and I know not all of us keep log books yet. I hope it's um, clearer that uh, put it in your log book or make sure manifest knows that, hey, I'm doing this two way so you can actually have a record of it. So when it comes time to get in touch with your examiner or your uh, regional director to renew your ratings, they can actually see that you've done them. All right. Awesome. You're welcome. All right, what else do we got? Or your local SNTA? Yes, very true, absolutely. Work smarter, not harder. Again, we may not all be still logging stuff, but it absolutely is easier when we go to renew things if we actually have proof of it, all right? All right, we're coming up on our hour, folks. Any last couple of questions or anything before we go to sign off? No? I see some, uh, hang on. Reserves, how old is too old? Ah, how old is too old? Hmm. This I'm so opinionated when it comes to this. If your reserve is older than you, or if your reserve is maybe older than your spouse or one of your children, probably chances are you might wanna get a new reserve. Um, but then again, I've seen 20 year old reserves that look better than five year old reserves. So, um, some manufacturers say, hey, 20 years, it's grounded uh, and it's no longer serviceable. But some manufacturers say, hey, at the end of 20 years or 40 repacks, you can send it back to us. We will reline it and we'll recertify it for however many pack jobs they'll recertify it for and send it back to you. All right. So, but I also recommend there is a, uh, there is um, guidance on how to field pull test a reserve to make sure that like a tensile strength test to make sure that if it's gonna fail, it's gonna fail on the ground and not in the sky. All right. How many people count as a formation? I believe in the IRM or the SIM, it says two or more. How many count as a formation? Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can we have your website? Yes, you can. Let me get it written directly can, for I you. I can put so, that in here. If there's a couple more in there, if you wanna get those and I'll get your website. Is it? Yeah, if you could do that. Um, yeah. Where'd my screen go? Sorry, guys. Uh, where are, where is he? <laughs> All 
I like the chicken fingers up from the diner on our drop sign, actually. <laughs> At what point should someone get looking to purchase gear between AFF? Uh, great question, Rachel. Um, at, the question was, at what point should someone get looking to purchase gear between your AFF and your A license? So typically, your gear is provided for you during AFF. All right, once you get your A license, there's still that window that you want to look at. Okay, let's start looking at gear. All right, if you're on the larger side of the jumpers, okay, and you're a very, very tall individual, you're very burly, and I'm not gonna say guy or girl because I've seen them both, um, you might have a smaller opportunity in used gear market than you would getting custom gear. And on the flip side, if you are a tiny, tiny little person, you know, fun sized, you might end up, again, having a smaller size purchase point in gear. So I would say, wait till you get your license, but make sure that you work with your rigger and or instructor to make sure you're getting something that one, isn't older than you, um, is appropriate for your skill level, that will hold the canopies that you're safely able to fly at that point. Um, and please always get um, a pre-buy inspection. Don't just buy something sight unseen because man, I did that once and got screwed um, <clears throat> ground training. Helping with A license cards. How does that apply to maintaining your coach rating? Question. Um, yeah, who's that? Freddie. Freddie, hi, Freddie. What's up? What's your question? Hey, I got a question. If you have a reserve mm -hmm. that's past uh, it's a hundred eighty day pack day, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Should you blow it out of the container or just keep it? Just keep it in the container until you time for a rigger to repatch it. But that That's a great. I live way down in the middle of nowhere, Texas, in mm -hmm. South Texas, and I go out and skydive with my my uh, best friend Jay Stokes or John Shelton. You know, every six months or so. And so, just wondering, should I just keep it? You know, I keep my main reserve and everything all packed up, but in a you know double. Cordura bags with no bugs or mice or anything can get to it. But I just wanted, should you blow your reserve out, you know? No, you know what? I think it's a great question. Um, I'm super cautious when it comes to transporting open reserves just because of the snag hazard. And God forbid if something snags it, it could cost you more downtime and more money in the long run. So I would say keep it packed until you get it to your rigor, until you get it to the loft. And if you want to pull your handles and blow it then, Totally do it then because it's a more controlled environment and uh, less likely to have damage during transport. So this one, this one more question on your BOC yep. uh, pilot shoot. If you're not going to be uh, jumping your rig for a while, should you just should you take it out of the elastic pouch and just uh, like lift your closing uh, right. the main closing flap and just tuck it in there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I meant. Yeah. Uh huh. I, I really like that idea, Freddie. I've done that quite a few times in the past with some of our gear, so it doesn't stretch out the spandex. And uh, sometimes the pilot shoe can either have debris in it, be a little bit damp. You don't want to keep it in there and maybe get moldy, but I really like that idea. Take it out of the yeah. BOC, tuck it under your main pin flap, and uh, and that way it stays out of uh, out of harm's way. So that's a great point. Oh, yeah, because all this stuff's kind of getting new to me. I've been keeping track of it, but my D number is 754. And so I'm learning that's, something new every day, you know? <laughs> that's awesome, Freddie. I'm so glad that you joined us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right, let's see. We had a couple other questions here in the chat. Uh, I noticed that I give my chest rub a little tight that my slider stuff so much is above my Okay, so Kara, this is a really great and I hope you guys don't mind me calling you out by your name here, but uh, Kara says, I noticed that my that if I give my chest strap a little tight, a little bit more tightening, uh, that your slider stops several inches above my risers where you can't reach it. And when I adjust the tightness, okay, so if you think about this, your three rings should sit right in front of your shoulders, right? Right in front of your shoulder pockets. Your risers go straight up from there. If you tighten your chest strap enough and you're squeezing your chest enough, it's bringing it into almost a slight angle, so an upside down V. So the lines are a little bit wider. They're gonna get snagged because they're not gonna have enough room to come straight down, okay? So 
if you get the slider down just enough and you can't jog it down by pumping our brakes, right? Because we want the slider at least halfway down. So if we can't get it by pumping our brakes or we can't grab it by grabbing our rear risers, quickly sharpening, sharply pulling on them real quick, that should bring it down. Um, you can always try loosening your chest strap just a little bit, all right? Not all the way, just a little bit to see if it'll bring everything back into line and bring your slider back down. Um, but I've also, uh, with an articulate harness, I don't think an articulated harness would help. Um, that's just my opinion. I think that um, you probably can also get a little bit longer poles on your, if it's a collapsible slider. I know I've, I've sewn extra little tabs on a couple of my jumper sliders so they can grab them a little bit easier. Um, but I think a couple extra little tricks, if you were to grab your rear risers and pull them just real quick, it usually jogs it down just enough that you're able to grab it. But also the risers might be too um, might be too long for you, so they're stopping up a lot higher. All right? Do you also have? I wonder if you also have slider stops on them. I'm not a fan of those, but there were no reserves older than me. Nice, Dave. <laughs> um, when buying gear, is a recommended order? Uh, you know, Rachel, that's a great question. Is a recommended order of buying your own gear? Always check with your uh, with your instructors if you're still on student status. But typically, the biggest thing everyone wants to get into is let's get a closed face helmet. Nobody likes the old face, the open face helmets anymore. They want closed face. But I always say try one new thing per skydive. You're not going to want to throw a new altimeter, a new helmet, a a blacked out visor, a brand new jumpsuit. There's so many new things going on the chances of you having some type of issue with something and not addressing it in the appropriately safe manner. I would say, uh, go with the helmet first, see how that's working out for you. Um, a lot of our kids don't like the big analog altimeters anymore. They wanna go right to digital. And I always say, if you're gonna do that, use them both for a bit until you get used to the new one. And then you can phase out the old one. All right. And I've always had an audible in my ear. I absolutely love it. Uh, is there a question? Have same problem being five foot? Mm. Ah, Mackenzie, yep. And a little fun size. All right. All right, guys. I think that we've gotten through most of the questions, which is awesome. And remember, if you don't know something, just ask. Someone in some of our community will know the answer or we will find it out for you. Um, don't just assume. And also remember, we have people in these groups and in our, our sport that have brand new A licenses. And then we have 12,000 jumps, 20,000 jumps. You are never too many jumps into your skydiving career where you can't learn something new. All right, we just had a 12,000 jump instructor today say, hey, could you give me a packing class because I need to brush up on my sport canopy packing. Uh, you know, he was embarrassed to say, hey, I'm just not a good packer and I'd rather not pack, but I wanna get better at it. So just because you're a couple hundred jumps in doesn't mean you can't ask for a refresher because if you don't ask, guaranteed someone else is thinking the same exact thing. All right. Matthew, how do I feel about using a wearable smartwatch? Uh, you know what? We had a couple of, uh, couple of my fellow jumpers that did that with, um, the, I have a Sunto, they were using Garmin's. You know what? I don't see a downside in them, but I do see that the displays aren't super big, you know? and um, I always like that backup altimeter. So I'll wear both of them, the analog and the digital. You know, the new Dekunus are out there now. They have so much smart information on them. It's really awesome. Um, I don't know. I'd rather leave my watch on the ground. I don't need to tell time up in the sky. And I'd rather have that big, that big dial um, so I could see my, my altitude. All right. Okay. Well, all of you, there's not a lot of videos here. I would love to see everyone's face before we leave tonight, if we can all, because I've got, I don't know if you guys can see behind me on my screen, my dog. A little bit, but look at all these awesome faces. I'm so happy that you all joined us and I would love to hear feedback on this. And, um, you can comment in the group and everything in the event on Facebook or drop me a message. I know uh, Shannon threw my website in there and everything. And uh, we just love to hear about it. If there's specific things that you guys wanna see in these Zooms coming forward, I'll run it here, uh, shoot me a message and we'll do a quick, I'll do a quick YouTube video or something and address whatever you have to, uh, whatever your question is, all right? 
Let's see. New messages. Also email your ideas to support promo at usk.org. And I will send out an email to everyone who registered. So um, it'll have a link to this YouTube recording. Do you want me to send out the PowerPoint download with that, Shauna? You totally yeah. can. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. And don't forget. I so love Luke. I love that. <laughs> I saw that and I messaged him. I'm like, Luke, that's, I knew I recognized that container. <laughs> In the spirit of the Zoom call, here's our safety day promo. So get out there, get to your local safety day. If you can't, we're going to have lots of resources online. So at least yeah. refresh yourself as much as you can. So Awesome, guys. Yeah. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And this has been recorded. So we're going to, we're going to be able to post this so you guys can reference it for uh for later if someone hasn't seen it we can always just uh make sure we post it all right one last question yeah hey, if you're jumping like uh military gear we just started a thing on facebook big boys jump club for you have to weigh 200 <laughs> pounds or more to get on wow a okay of, a lot of the guys you know like me have custom rigs made by you know pd and places like that but there's a lot of guys who go out and buy the the military is getting rid of the MC fours, which are like uh, 375 feet, mm -hmm. you know, canopy of reserve. And when you take it to some riggers, I heard they don't really understand that reserve, you know, made by uh, Paraflight or whoever it used to be made by. What yeah. would you suggest? What would you suggest these guys do who have these military uh, rigs? You know what I mean? And, and canopies. Yeah. But when they do take it to the rigger, it goes, man, I never seen one like this. You know what I mean? So, I do. I do exactly know what you mean. Um, I've seen them a couple of times. I would say that um, if the manufacturers of the specific military rigs are still in existence, they would be my first step to getting um, accurate packing manuals for them. And uh, we have a pretty wide um, reach when it comes to riggers that um, have resources that we can tap into. I know I have a bunch of um, old school riggers by me that I can call up and say, hey, I've got this old military rig. Can you walk me through it? I haven't seen one like this before. Um, you know, because some of them don't, aren't, up to, aren't up to code with the TSO standards that we have now. So some of them shouldn't really be used unless they've been brought up to those standards. And I know there's a couple of, uh, couple of reenactment teams that do do that, that that retrofit the, the military containers for uh, modern day sport jumping. But I would say that uh, we'd check with the manufacturers first. And if not, it doesn't hurt to call uh, Fort Lee down in Virginia um, where the military riggers train. I mean, that might be a little bit of uh, a better resource as well. So, okay, that sounds yeah. good. Or you could call uh, uh, one of the private military free fall schools or you can. School out of Yuma and get some intel there yeah I love those guys out there yes they're very uh, they're very uh, resourceful out there and they have a lot of uh, a lot of different manuals that can help I worked for with them a couple of times so yeah good guys out there yeah they are uh, oh real quick here's another question uh, any recommendations the best place for a hook knife yeah great question so uh, I have butterfingers so I want one on each each hip, <laughs> if I could have two, I would say uh, leg straps are the best, um, but I have seen people put them on their mud flaps um, that they can get fit with pouches underneath the mud flaps. So you can just pull down and it's right there. Um, I've also seen people who haven't attached them anywhere yet and they put them right into their chest straps. So as long as you have one, right? And again, if you're butterfingers like me, I have one on each hip, <laughs> so let's see. And please get a good hook knife. Don't use the plastic ones that come with your container that come from the manufacturer. They will break. Trust me, ask me how I know. They'll break. And um, yeah, don't try to go through the airports with them either. They get very nervous when they start showing up on x-rays. <laughs> right, Harold, so did I... you have your hand up? I thought maybe you had a question, but I wasn't sure. Oh, you're still okay. muted. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> no, you, okay. <laughs> Any recommendation for Matthew? That is an that's actually an awesome question. It's pretty funny. So um I like bike shorts or under armor, and I wear tights underneath my swoop shorts 
Um, cause nothing's worse than getting a wedgie mid, uh, mid jump or mid AFF or midday. Um, nothing with seams, please just stay away from seams. They're just, shaping's no good. They get stuck places. It's no good. Don't wear seams <laughs> and don't wear cotton. Oh my God. Chafing. Don't do that either. Especially in the summer. <laughs> uh, let's see. Do we have extra hook knives at the DZ? Yes, we do. Not that javelin hook knives stink. I'm obviously a SunPath sponsored athlete, but um, a lot of times they're just tiny little plastic little knives. And you want some bench made, bench, bench made, benchmark. They actually make really good smaller metal ones and they're not heavy. They're very good quality. It might cost you a couple extra dollars, but um, totally worth it. If you need to cut some type of line on something, you've got you know, a reserve made entanglement or a line over on your reserve and you need to cut that, you don't want like, I don't know, a, a big disposable razor, right? You want something with a little bit of meat behind it. Does it make any difference on pilot shoot folding, whether you fold it in thirds before BS fold or after? Uh, totally personal preference, as long as your folds are, I like to, to make even, and I have a little video, we do uh, pizza and then taco and then burrito, and then I fold it in. Um, but I do the S folds of the bridle before I start folding the pilot chute. Um, and just make sure your bridle's not twisted. Make sure it's nice and flat. A good place to look for a good hook knife is on your EMS sites, emergency medical service sites. That is correct. Because as long as the shears, but they have, a, uh, they call it a seat belt cutter, but what, what it is, it's a hook yep. knife. And so, and they don't always have to be big. And so, you know, I always thought, well, the, this hook knife doesn't work. I always use the, you know, the scissors and cut through a nickel. You know what I mean? To cut whatever yep. I need to cut, you know? So that's just an idea. That's a great, and you can find them a whole bunch of places on the internet, just Google search. Um, and a lot of manufacturers come up. Um, so I'm gonna answer this question real quick. Uh, best altimeter for new jumper after AFF, digital or audible? Right, so this is a two part question. A digital is the altimeter that you wear on your wrist. And yes, it might have some type of audible alarm on it. All right. But an audible is something that you wear inside your helmet. And that's what it's for. It will beep and it will um, it'll indicate different altitudes. There are some digital altimeters that can be used as an audible. OK. But there are also audible alt altimeters that cannot be used on your wrist. So understand what you're buying before you buy it. All right. So um, I would say I like I like both. All of my helmets have an audible in them. OK, so whether I'm um, keyed in on a student during AFF or I'm shooting tandem video and I can't I'm not constantly looking at my wrist because I'm focused on my student, um, which, again, you shouldn't be doing, but I can hear in my ear when it goes off. Now I make sure that all of my altimeters and audibles are interchangeable because I don't ever wanna be caught without something in my ear or an appropriate altimeter on my wrist. All right, so when you start looking for altimeters, digital altimeters, if it also says audible and you can use it in your ear, awesome. But again, make sure you're looking at that description because if you buy an audible, sometimes you cannot use it on your wrist. All right, so know what you're, um, know what you're purchasing. Okay, and if you have a question about it, you guys have our contact information now. You can totally ask and we'll, um, and we'll let you know. What's a good pen to mark your line when, oh, your kill line. Awesome. So we all know that when we cock our pilot shoots, if we have a collapsible pilot shoot, that little window that it's going to start getting faded, Sharpie marker. All right. Cock your pilot shoot, make sure it's cocked. And then all you got to do is just take that, that uh, material, pull it out a little bit, recolor your your uh, where your window is and every on your uh, on the actual kill line and then recock your pilot shoot and you should have color in your window. All right. Or cock your pilot shoot, make sure it's cocked and just color it while it's in the window. But I use a uh, I use a Sharpie marker. I'll use uh, more than like I'll use green or blue. I have been known to use purple, um, but as long as there's color in the window. All right. That was a really good question. Cool. All right. Got a couple of. Uh, we still got 34 people that are logged on. This is great. All right. Well, I it's hope that, yeah, I hope that this uh, 
that this presentation tonight gave you guys some um, gave you guys some good content for your own safety days this weekend if you're going. Let's see who else is here? White Sharpie? Yep, totally. Use a use a white or silver Sharpie. That works, Sean. I see your winky face there. You're funny. And uh, did I see it posted correctly that you were awarded the Chess Judy Safety Award at your safety day? Mr. Ooh. Sean Healy? Yeah. Okay. Congratulations. That's awesome. Nice. I hope that all you guys get a chance to meet your uh, your Chess Judy Safety Award recipients at your safety day. I know that more Dropsons are getting on board with recommending their um, their individuals with that. Very cool. All right. Well, we're coming up in an hour and 20 minutes. I'm going to go ahead and uh, have Shannon do our little sign off real quick here and everything. So if you guys have anything else, please be safe. Have a great safety day. Have a great start of your season. You have all of our contact information and just keep in touch. All right. We'll see you guys next month. Perfect sign off. I got nothing. Right. Except go to safety day and thank you for joining us and look out for the next one. There'll be a... Um, we're going to do a canopy piloting workshop at the end of March. So stay tuned for that. And then we're going to have Jim Crouch do um, the fatality summary in a workshop in April. Nice. So that'll be really uh, valuable and important for folks to attend. So be on the lookout for registration for those in the update that goes out mid month each month. Happy safety day, everybody. Thanks for joining Happy us. Happy safety day. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you.